Okay, good morning. Uh, today is July 18th, 2021. Our sermon today title is Resurrection of Life Based Upon Jesus' Love. This is very, I think this is a crucial time in the history of the United States, and you'll see if this makes sense or not. I'm a Reverend Walter Frank, pastor of Family Church of San Diego, and our large organization, Family Federation for World Peace Unification. The name's changed several times since then, but I haven't been able to keep up. It's my fault. Okay, let's go. So let's start. Jesus, Christian love through the Christian cultural sphere. So Jesus is a life-giving spirit, right? And many people, millions of people, have reported that through some interaction, through prayer, through deep thought, uh, at some serious time in their life, in prison and many other places, they found and met Jesus Christ. He has intervened in their life spiritually. But how does Jesus work in the life of all of us physically? That's what this church is about. That Jesus actually works through what we call the Christian cultural sphere to save your lives physically. You'll see. Watch. You'll see. It'll make sense. So there are many ideas about the best way to live life on earth, right? Many ideas, especially the United States right now. Uh, the second major idea, two main ideas are one, materialism with Marxist socialism being the predominant version of materialism. There's many materialists. There's Stoics, there's other people who don't believe in God. There's the nuns, right? They call themselves the nuns now, N-O-N-E-S. I don't believe in any religion. I have no religion. They're called the nuns. Uh, but they aren't going to set you on fire or torture you to death or starve you. Uh, Marxists will. Anyway, we'll, we'll get into that, right? Stoicism, there, there are still some Stoics left in the world. It's a Greek idea of thought that the world is a miserable, bitter place and there's no use complaining. That's what a Stoic is. On the other hand, the second major form is the first form or second form and the constitutional republics. The United States being the most predominant based upon the Christian cultural sphere of influence, right? If you're anywhere in the world, people are speaking English, right? Even if you go to Japan, they still speak English. You know why? Because America is the dominant cultural sphere in the world today. We love Japanese people, and Japanese people love us. But, and that's the point. Germany, they speak English, etc., etc. Okay, this is what Mother said about the, sec the second cultural sphere called Marxism. This is what Mother said recently on June 5th. She says, I have been saying this for a long time now, but China has been considering world domination centered on the communist system. So I told them that they cannot contribute to the world with communism. They should just forget such ideas. Who is she talking to? Probably our young people in our church. Just forget it, right? I have done several world tours, and she could go to Africa, and she could see that Chinese Marxists are trying to take over Africa. Right? Uh, that I feel China is attempting to expand their territory and influence different ide areas in order to dominate the world. And listen to this. The reason heaven blessed America, according to his, God's providence, is because he can save the world through America. The United States of America. That's what Mother came to say. We had to save Christianity and save America because there isn't another country that offers that hope. So, Mother says, China is advancing toward a communist world, centering on itself. But America, and America has always been one step too late. She was really upset with American political leaders. Mother says, America has to become a nation that, attending our creator, heavenly parents, at the center of a democratic world. However, no one in our government has come to their senses and recognizes the threat of China. That, makes, that, that seems clear to me. So this is, she says, America was to become, was to become a nation that attending our creator God, heavenly parents, at the center of a democratic world, not a Marxist world, not a socialist world, a democratic world. However, no one has come to their senses. I, anyhow, I was going to say something about our political figures, but I thought, <laughs> I thought better to control myself. Thank you, Father. Okay, so this is, so... Does mother understand communism? Do you think she understands communism? This is from her, this is from her mother peace book, page 46. She says this. In 1945, Korea enjoyed the liberation from Japan. Its people had long desired. But North Korea soon fell under communist control. 
socialist control of North Korea, right? So here's what she says. The communist oppression of religion knew no bounds. The inside the womb church was not spared. One of its members accused a group of amassing wealth, and the communist police took Hyo Ho Bin and many of her followers to Daedong police station in Pyongyang. So security guards interrogated Hyo Ho Bin harshly and mocked her. Right? They would torture people. When she says harshly, it doesn't mean harshly. It means they tortured her and eventually killed her. So mother's pastor was killed by the communists in Daedong prison. Right? If you read, I can't read her whole book, but if you read her book, when her pastor was killed, they decided it's time for us to leave. But listen to this part. Listen to this part. In 1948, when the oppression of religions by North Korea's Communist Party was at its height, my mother and grandmother were also in prison for nearly two weeks for being members of the Inside Womb Church. You know, mother's mother was in, pri was in prison too. Wow. Wow. They let her, let her out. So, so does mother know something about communism from her life history? Yes. She says she was five years old and eventually her mother and grandmother got out and then they immediately decided, let's escape south. We can't stay here. We're going to be killed or tortured to death. And they tortured Christians to death on a regular basis. There's something about Marxism. If you read uh, uh, Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago or you read Reverend Verbrand's Torture for Christ, Marxists have some idea that the best way to deal with Christians is torturing them to death. They don't just shoot them in the head. They torture them to death. And so you can think about that. Okay. So let's look at the results of both systems and hopefully, on the other hand, they're teaching Marxism in California schools, right? The legislature just passed a bill that the California school system is now absolutely going to teach uh, Marxist critical race theory in high schools in California. That just passed, right? People are trying to fight it. Conservatives, religious people should fight it. But somehow, Californians think Marxist race theory is a great idea. And so does, uh, so does uh, many of the senators and representatives from the Demo Democrat Party, including Joe Biden, who thinks those are great ideas. Let's do it. So anyhow, so which system makes sense to anybody with any common sense? Both, uh, both sides, of course, acknowledge there's even the world. In the Council Lecture, page 67, it makes clear that both sides believe there's evil in the universe. However, there are radically different ways of dealing with evil in our world, right? So, number one, Marxist belief in the dialectic. Dialectic starts with die, as in the word division. They believe that the way the world should work is you should divide groups into separate groups. For example, uh, white people should be in a separate group, and black and brown people should kill them mercilessly. That's what critical race theory teaches. You should divide people and then kill them mercilessly by torture. So that's what our California high school teachers are going to be teaching in the next uh, few years. So, for example, dialectical violence leads to what? Famine, low food production, starvation in the Ukraine. Seven million Ukrainians were killed by Stalin. China, millions starved to death. North Korea are still starving to death. Venezuela, they finished eating their pets. Now they're trying to eat trash. Just listen to the news. Venezuelans elected Hugo Chavez, who was a Marxist, and now they're in hell. In Venezuela right now, sorry, in Cuba right now, they're rioting for food. Just let us have food, something to eat. This is what the Marxist dialectic brings. Unfortunately, somehow our politicians, just like Mother said, our pol politicians, when are they going to come to their senses and figure this out? Okay, on the other hand, what does the Christian cultural sphere believe is that cooperation with God brings intuition and breakthroughs in science and is spread to the whole world peacefully through cooperation. That's the co Christian cultural sphere. And I'm going to give you some examples that are undeniable today and you're going to be amazed. Number one, we're not atheists. We believe that Jesus Christ is still the central figure of all human history. That Jesus Christ is still alive, is a central figure of all human history, and is a source of the greatest blessings for all mankind. All the greatest things you like come from the Christian cultural sphere. Everything, every single thing. And there's not a single thing 
that you buy from a socialist country that you want to buy from a so Nobody buys a Russian-made car. Nobody buys anything from Russia or China or North Korea. There's nothing. You don't buy anything from Venezuela. Nothing. Everything you buy is from European countries or American countries or free democratic countries. Everything. Right? So based upon his absolute faith, Jesus was resurrected. And based upon Jesus' resurrection, Jesus were God's providence from the spirit world, which exists. Ma materialist atheists don't believe it exists, but Christians believe it exists, gain intuition and ideas for technology, for salvation. So 1 Corinthians 5.45, Jesus became a life-giving spirit, and the world is blessed through Jesus' body, which is called the church. Christians are blessing the world unbelievably. Jesus said, why? Because he said, I'm going to make all things new. Through the body of Christ, I'm going to make all things in this world new. Galatians 3.14, He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. What's that promise and what's the blessing of Abraham? I'll tell you. The C. Genesis, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So all peoples on earth will be blessed, whether they're Christians or not, will be blessed by Christ's disciples. <clears throat> I know there's a lot of anti-Christian sentiment out there. People say, no, there was Christians did the Crusades. Christians had, what, the Protestants. All those things happened hundreds of years ago. And they, they stopped. They made peace. Anyhow, so... The whole world is blessed through Christians. God's blessing of Jesus and his disciples, us, is irrevocable and unstoppable. Based on faith, the body of Christ is discovering the laws of God, right? I can show you all the history of science is through Isaac Newton, Kepler, uh, all those guys. Francis Bacon wrote the laws of science and that, that we've been practicing them ever since. So, last week I explained how antiseptic surgery arrived in America and then to the rest of the world. How, where did all the hospitals come from? Came from Christianity. Every single hospital you know was brought, built by Christians. Uh, applying Louis Pasteur, who was a strong Catholic, advances in microbiology. Joseph Lister, who was a Quaker. So you have a Catholic, Louis Pasteur, Quaker Joseph Lister, between 1883 and 1890, was a British surgeon and pioneer of antiseptic surgery. When you go to the dentist and they antiseptically fix your teeth, who are you going to have to thank? A Quaker and a Catholic. That's who invented, that's who invented who saves your miserable life. <laughs> Just kidding about the miserable life. Lister's work led to a re reduction in post-operative infections and made surgery safer for patients, distinguishing him as the father of modern surgery. Who's the father of modern surgery? A Quaker. Make sense? I know, who's, why? Because Jesus is working through Christians to bless every kind of person, right? As we say, there's the antiseptic surgery in Japan where they aren't Christian, in communist countries where they aren't Christian, in Muslim countries where they aren't Christian, in India where they aren't. All those places have antiseptic surgery due to Christianity, due to Christians cooperating with them, teaching them these ideas, and saving their worthless lives, right? So, November 19, 1876, Dr. Lewis Atterbury Stimson recently appointed a attending surgeon at which, which hospital? Presbyterian Hospital in New York City conducted the first antiseptic surgery in the USA. So he's a Presbyterian, Presbyterian, the first antiseptic surgery created by the Quaker Joseph Lister, Dr. Joseph Lister, by Louis Pasteur, the chemist Catholic, brings antiseptic surgery to all atheists, to all people, to Jews, to Christians, to Muslims. All this comes from the body of Christ. Does that make sense? Yes. Well, this is only a tip of the iceberg. Right? As I say, all these things are blessed by people in Central and South America, Europe, Asia, India. Catholic and Christian churches building and sustaining hospitals in all those countries. In fact, Catholic churches have built more hospitals throughout the world than any single country has hospitals in that country. Right? How many hospitals are in the United States? A thousand? Catholics have more than a thousand hospitals in South America and India and Asia and all over the whole world. So, where do people go if you're in Africa for antiseptic surgery or a doctor? They go to a Catholic hospital, right? And we know nuns and they're... 
So Christianity is spreading healing and pasteurization all, to all countries on earth, saving billions of lives. Billions of lives, right? How many lives are saved by having pure water in the United States instead of dirty water? 200 years ago, nobody knew cholera came from water. Nobody knew that. And so thousands of people would die from cholera. There'd be a cholera epidemic or a, or a yellow fever epidemic, and people would die just from drinking water, and they had no idea. So there you go. Okay. We say the Holy Spirit is manifesting the three blessings on earth through our Christian emotion of love and compassion, through intellect of the truth of creation, through science, and through the will to do good, through missionaries and Christian doctors and all the, all the good people on earth. Medicines, water desalination, and today I will explain food production and the Christian cultural sphere that has literally saved more than two billion lives on earth from starvation. Watch. Okay, this was how people used to harvest grain in, what do you think this country is? That's Egypt, right? And you can see, here's the lady, probably beautiful wife of the hard-working farmer, and he's cutting the grain, the wheat grain, with his scythe here. Make sense? Okay, yeah. so this is 5,000 years later how technology advanced. They put a stick on it. <laughs> See, this is, eight, <laughs> this is 19th century technology for cutting grain. That's a great stick. stick, gigantic, step forward for mankind, right? No, it's not. People couldn't harvest enough food, so cities were always lacking food. There were always famines. There were always pro you always heard in the past, famine, 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 right? Okay, so this is, this is 20th century Ukraine. Still, she's got the stick. Still, wife is still collecting the wheat, but you can't feed enough people with those kinds of things. So what does God think? Uh, there's going to be 7.6 billion people on earth. I have to invest in somebody to invent a, a way to farm that's better than sticks. Okay? So, listen to this. In the late 1960s, most experts said that global famines in which billions would die would soon occur. Biologist Paul R. Ehrlich wrote in his 1968 bestseller, The Population Bomb, that the battle to feed all humanity is over. In the 1970s and 1980s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in spite of any crash programs embarked upon. Did I mention he's an atheist? Did I mention that? Atheists hope for the future is they're all going to die. <laughs> Erlock also said, I have yet to meet anyone familiar with the situation who thinks India will be self-sufficient in food by 1971, and India couldn't possibly feed 200 million more people by 1980. They already had 700 million people. What happened? It didn't happen, did it? Uh, two people, two really significant person. There's a third, but I don't have time for him today. Here's how it worked. Of all the inventions during the first half of the 19th century which revolutionized agriculture, the reaper was probably the most important, wrote University of Chicago historian William Hutchinson in his two following biography of McCormick in the 1930s. What was the most significant invention in the 20th century? This, th this guy thinks it was a uh, International Harvester's Mechanical Reaper. The reaper broke the harvest labor bottleneck by allowing a farmer to reap as much as he could sow. This big step toward automation allowed farms to become larger and more productive. In turn, the mechanization of agriculture accelerated industrialization and urbanization as displaced workers migrated more rapidly to farms from the, to the factories. Okay? Who invented that? But more importantly, why did he invent the reaper? Let's read. Here, let me, sh let me explain that to you. 1831, Cyrus demonstrated his reaper. It was noisy and awkward. It rattled, frightened the horses, still cut the grain. It was revolutionary. For in a few hours, the reaper harvested as much grain as two or three men could cut in a whole day. Do you understand? Food production now is millions of tons. One of the most significant figures is Cyrus McCormick and this invention. The th but the real question, real, real reason isn't what he invented, it's why he invented it. Listen, let's read his, from his biography. Here it is. Uh, Cyrus McCormick invented the mechanical reaper, and McCormick's invention would make him prosperous and famous. But he was a religious young man who believed his mission was to help feed the world. He's a Christian young man who thought, my job is to help feed the world. Right? So here's what he says. 
McCormick saw his work as a holy calling. He thought he's a saint. My job as God's man is to build machinery that can help feed all mankind, right? So Cyrus's spiritual life changed when he was 25. He attended a series of church services one week with his parents and siblings. The following Sunday, Cyrus made a, Cyrus made a public confession of faith and decided his mission on earth is to build a reaper that will feed everybody in the world. Okay, so based on his work, we went from this after 5,000 years of technology, he went to this. See that? Now because of Cyrus McCormick, farmers can farm us tens, millions of tons of food to feed people all around the world. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Listen, that's only the beginning, right? Listen to this guy. This guy's name is Norman Borlaug. He's a Christian Lutheran who's an agricultural scientist. Similar story. Norman Borlaug and the end of famine at the end of the 20th century. He ended famines. Watch, you'll see. Borlaug was one of the early trustees of Bread for the World, serving from 1975 to 1980. And Bread for the World is a Christian organization dedicated to feeding the world's hungry. Still exists, by the way. You can donate to them if you want. Let's see. In an article about his funeral, he was described as a devout Lutheran whose faith was the motivation for his mission to use science to feed people. Do you see this over and over again? His faith made him want to feed people. Do you know why? Because Jesus fed the 5,000. Jesus fed people. If Jesus had compassion on people and fed people, so he thinks, Borlaug thinks, my mission is to use science to feed millions of people. That's my job, right? So according to his daughter, who is quoted in the article, it also means that he regularly attended church when out, not working in his mission field. So he thought his mission is what? Growing food to feed people. He excelled. He said, in his words, food is the moral right of all who are born into this world. Almost certainly, however, the first essential component of social science is adequate food for all mankind. That's his mission. Then, okay, then by devout, developing and applying the scientific and technological skills of the 20th century for the well-being of mankind throughout the world, we may still see Isaiah's promises come true. So this is Norman Borlaug's words. And the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose, and the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. And may these words come true. So this is Norman Borlaug's idea. My mission is to feed everybody on earth. Which, by the way, he did. Ehrlich's predictions, the one who said we're all, everybody's going to starve to death, failed to materialize when India became self-sustaining in cereal production in 1974, only six years later. Now India is self-sustaining, right? In fact, they export food. As a result of the introduction of what? Norman Borlaug's dwarf wheat varieties of wheat. He, decided, he created new kinds of wheat, he, and he began in Mexico. What America, through Dr. Bolog, did was to create what has been labeled the Green Revolution. Instead of a communist revolution or a Marxist revolution, he made a green revolution of plenty of food for everybody in the world. Okay, whoops. Green Revolution usually refers to the transformation of agriculture that began in 1945. What happened was, one significant factor in this revolution was the Mexican government's request to America to establish an agriculture research station to develop more varieties of wheat that could be used to feed the rapidly growing population of the country. In 1943, Mexico imported half its wheat. From where? United States of America, by the way. But by 1956, the Green Revolution made Mexico self-sufficient. By 1964, Mexico exported half a million tons of wheat. Because they made so much more food than they needed, they could export it. These programs were instigated and largely funded by the Rockefeller Foundation along with the Ford Foundation among other major agencies. So what's happening? We call this cooperation, right? We call it common cause, common cooperation, and the ideas of the brilliant Christian scientists of the United States go to Mexico and now Mexico can feed all their people. Sort of a miracle, right? No one's killed, no wars, no, nothing bad, only food comes. With the experience of agriculture development begun in Mexico by Norman Borlaug in 1943, judged as a success, the Rockefeller Foundation sought to spread the Green Revolution to other nations. The way of our Christian culture's fear is sharing and cooperating to lift people out of poverty, not kill people. So here's what happened. In 1961, India was on the brink of mass famine. Borlaug was invited to India by the advisor of the Indian Minister of Agriculture, M.S. Swaminathan. India began its own Green Revolution pr program of plant breeding, irrigation development, and financing of fertilizers. So this isn't 
genetic modification. This is Mendelian genetics. He used Mendel's idea of understanding genetics to create hybrid uh, grains of rice and wheat so that they would hold more seeds than, than that normal. Due to Norman, Norman Borlaug's science in 1968, Indian agronomist S. K. D. Data publishes findings that IR8 rice yield about 5 tons per hectare with no fertilizer and almost 10 tons per hectare under optimal conditions. This was 10 times the yield of traditional rice. So when the Indian people are farming, they could get a ton of food from one acre, but now they could get 10 tons of food from one acre. Makes a gigantic difference in feeding the people of India. That's why we don't read about Indians starving anymore, right? Because of who? Because of Norman Borlaug, Norman Borlaug, son of Lutheran ministers, a Lutheran himself who attended church, who believed his mission was to feed the whole world, which he did. Right? Famine in India, once accepted as inevitable by guys like Ehrlich, has not returned since the introduction of American-led Green Revolution in agriculture. Between 1965 and 1970, wheat yields nearly doubled in Pakistan and India, greatly improving the food security of those nations. These collective increases in yield have been labeled the Green Revolution, and Borlaug is often credited with saving over a billion people from starvation. So, my point is, this is how Jesus Christ saves people physically, through working with his descendants on earth, who are Lutherans and Catholics and Quakers and other kinds of Christians to actually feed people not just spiritually but in fact physically, right? His agents on earth, us Christians, are who does that. He was awarded a Nobel Prize in 1970 in recognition of his contributions to world peace through increasing food supply. People are, have a full tummy, they don't really care to ride so much. Between 1950 and 1984 as the Green Revolution transformed agriculture around the globe, World grain production increased by 250%. That's only to this grow more now, of course. The production increases fostered by the Green Revolution are widely credited with having helped avoid widespread famine and feeding billions of people across the world. Now there's 7.5 billion people, right? How are they still alive? Because of Norman Borlaug, Cyrus McCormick, a few others, uh, Fritz Haber, and a few others who made gigantic increases in production. Now, I can't put everybody here. George Washington Carver was significant uh, in this science, actually. There are many more people, but I can't put them all here. The two most significant are Cyrus McCormick and the Borlaug. So this is, uh, this is rice farming now in uh, Asia, right? So here's Cyrus McCormick's invention, and here's Norman Borlaug's invention. And what are they doing, right? This is, I don't know if this is Korea or Japan, but this is now automated rice planting, right? You see they, they used to do it, right? You can see those. And then uh, modern harvesting machines in India, right? They're selling these modern, so Indians can feed, feed themselves. Pakistanis can feed themselves. There's another rice, this rice harvester, I don't know where it is, Japan or Asia or something like that. The point is, how does Jesus Christ save human lives on earth? through science, through scientists, and then sharing that technology, right? Borlaug didn't charge them any money to do that. He just went there, volunteered, and the Rock Rockefeller Foundation paid his wages to be able to do that. So we call this salvation through cooperation, through descent of the Holy Spirit, because all these guys thought the same thing. They got their ideas from God. They didn't just think them up themselves. God gave them those ideas. Okay. The Green Revolution is unpopular among many leftists because of its context within the Cold War. A major critic of the Green Revolution, U.S. Inve investigative journalist writes, the primary objective of the program was geopolitical, to provide food for the populace in underdeveloped countries and so bring social stability and weaken the fomenting of communist insurgency. It's always fomenting. <coughs> Foment. Hatred. Okay. So here's the two, this is for our young people to listen to these ideas. Here's our side, Christian cultural sphere, this is one of the reasons I love America. America has sins in the past. And, and you, know, you know how positive people see the glass is half full and negative people see the glass is half empty? Yeah. Communists see the glass is full of evil. And it's you people, you Christians, who are the evil people. And they're dying to torture you to death. Don't think I'm kidding. They really think that. This is one of the reasons. America has sins, of course. We have some sins in our past. But what other nation is single-handedly responsible for saving billions of people from starvation? Who? 
and creating hospitals all around the world. Who? Nobody else. On the other hand, this is, uh, this is Dr. Borlaug. This is, uh, this is Mother Jones News, right? Mother Jones News is a leftist magazine, and they're writing about Marxism in their magazine. Here's what they say. For those who have read history or lived through the 20th century, it's hard to forget the tens of millions of people who starved to death under Mao Zedong, tens of millions purged, starved, or sent to gulags by Joseph Stalin, or the millions slaughtered in Cambodia by killing fields. Even if Marx himself never advocated genocide. Okay, so these, these, are, these are leftist, I would say leftist losers, but I won't say that because it's a church. They think Marx didn't advocate, gen of course he did. It's called the Marxist dialectic. It calls for violence and revolution. Anyhow, these stupendous atrocities and catastrophic economic murders were all done in the name of Marxism. From North Korea to Vietnam, 20th century communism always seemed to result in either crimes against humanity. Listen, communism, oh, this is from the left, always seemed to result in either crimes against humanity, grinding poverty, or both. Meanwhile, Venezuela, the most dramatic socialist experiment of the 21st century in a nation with the world's largest oil reserves, is in full economic collapse. Yeah, well, you know, the end, I didn't write the end of this. And the end is to say, well, it's all because the worst leaders did this. If only a good leader took up Marxism, then they w all these atrocities wouldn't happen. But my point is, that look, look, they always do happen. Even they think every single time, communists come in, they kill, murder, torture, starve, enslave. Right, I would say in 19, 1865, America ended slavery. In 1917, Soviet Union recreated slavery, right? S a gulag arp archipelago. Anyhow, so two alternatives of choices. Either Marxists, or people who believe in God, or materialism and not believing in God. We believe there's always three groups. One group believes in God. One group is neutral. They don't know what to believe. They're the nuns or the agnostics. The other group doesn't believe in God and then wants to make war on people who believe in God. Understand? We have to choose and we have to teach people this knowledge, so they'll know what side to choose. This is really from the Kaus Emanuel, by the way. If you read, I've been reading the Kaus Emanuel every day because of what's going on. Blessings of God and the end of famine, or starvation and murder by Marxist socialists. I thought I'd show you this one, this cartoon, just in case. What young people think about communism is. What communism really is. It's a firing squad, right? It always is the same. Young people think, oh, we're going to create a utopia. Then they're the first people to be killed in the firing squad. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. I hope that was uh, interesting.